uh, the topic for today's webinar is uh, how biostatistics can enhance institutional performance and efficiency. And uh, we're very happy to have Dr. Heidi Fath here with us uh, to take us through this. Uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, the third in a series of uh, webinars that we have uh, done. Uh, the first one uh, toward the end of Feb uh, on understanding and describing data distributions. Uh, then one we did uh, a couple of weeks ago on understanding types of data. Uh, and we've been very happy to have expert uh, trainers and speakers with us uh, to have delivered these webinars. Uh, if you've uh, if you've been a part of those, uh, you know, then uh, thank you for your participation. Uh, if you haven't, uh, but you'd like to, you know, receive that content, uh, feel free to write to us uh, and then we'll be happy to share a recording with you for your benefit. Right. Uh, with that, you know, I just want to also just uh, share uh, about the statistics uh, services. Uh, this is uh, a, a webinar on uh, on statistics and uh, the training part of uh, what Editage provides. Uh, we also provide services. Uh, and right now, there's, uh, there's an uh, offer running uh, where till the end of this month, and uh, there's just, I think, you know, just one more day. Uh, uh, but if you would like to consult, uh, you know, with an expert statistician, specifically about, uh, you know, the challenges you're facing and the problems you have with stats, uh, then uh, this is campaign running where you can reach out and book a free consultation uh, with our expert. So go ahead and do that. The offer uh, was originally valid till the 15th of the month. Uh, we've extended to the end of the month. Uh, so this is an opportunity you don't want to miss. Uh, and flowing from that, there are other services uh, that Editage uh, provides to uh, researchers, especially in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, also to in universities, uh, you know, through a university partnership. Uh, and all of those, uh, you know, you can find out more about uh, if you write in to us. Uh, if you want to just know more about other edited services uh, or you just want to understand how we can support your university, uh, support your researchers, uh, support, uh, help you improve publication output, uh, feel free to write to me. Uh, my name is Daniel. I oversee university partnerships uh, here at Editage and uh, my email is there uh, on screen. Uh, my associate will also paste it in the chat window uh, that's on the right of your screen. Right. Uh, with that, I uh, just want to introduce uh, the speaker for today. Uh, we're very happy to have with us Dr. Heidi Effat. She is uh, Associate Professor of uh, Pharmacology and Toxicology uh, at the Faculty of Pharmacy uh, at Ain Shams University, Egypt. Uh, she uh, did a PhD in the field of uh, neuroprotective strategies against Parkinson's uh, and uh, extremely prolifically published uh, with the Scopus Index uh, H index of 10, uh, and she's published uh, extensively in the areas of neuropharmacology, uh, wound healing protection against side effects associated with, uh, you know, administration of chemotherapeutic drugs. She's also a reviewer, uh, so she brings with us experience of not just being a, a well-published author, but also a reviewer for uh, many journals, international journals like toxicology, immunopharmacology, etc., uh, and she's passionate uh, about teaching and research. Uh, presently, she's the director of the International Rankings Office uh, at uh, the Faculty of Pharmacy at Ain Shams University. Uh, and she's dedicated to promoting excellence in academic and healthcare research. So with that, I uh, welcome uh, Dr. Heidi to now take over the session uh, and to uh, then bring to us uh, learnings. I'm sure you'll enjoy this. Uh, feel free to share your uh, comments uh, and your questions uh, in the chat window that's on the right. Uh, there will be time for a short Q&A at the end of the session. So, uh, so you know, be assured that you will uh, receive answers to your questions. Doctor, over to you. Uh, hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to present this session on the importance of biostatistics in uh, research and uh, especially in clinical research. Herein, we'll start talking about data-driven decision-making and how biostatistics can enhance institutional performance and efficiency. Um, the, the outline of this presentation will include a brief on the role of biostatistics in data-driven decision-making, 
the definition of biostatistics and its application in the healthcare research and examples of how biostatistics has been used to inform decision making in healthcare and in academic institutions. We will also talk about data collection and management regarding the strategies for collecting and managing data effectively, the importance of ensuring data quality and accuracy, and the best practices for data storage and security. And then we'll also talk about data analysis and an overview with the different statistical methods used in biostatistics and the best practices for presenting data in a way that is easy to understand. Well, to get started, what is data-driven decision-making? As the name indicates, it is the process of using data to inform your decision-making process and to validate a course of action before committing to it. One can guess the importance of data-driven decision-making in institutions. Well, it enables more confident decisions, reduces the amount of risk to the minimum possible, it helps with saving costs, fosters fact-based decision, decisions over assumption-based, it is very important that the decisions should not be solely dependent on one's experience or one's assumptions or intuition, but they should be, on the other hand, better based on data. So it increases the proactivity in decisions, decreases the bias in decisions, makes it easier to look back, then measure and evaluate, opens a path to analytics and better future decisions, and renders decision-making more transparent and objective. Before talking about biostatistics, we have to get acquainted with what is statistics. Statistics itself is a mathematical science. It is the study and manipulation of data, including the ways to collect, review, analyze, and draw conclusions from data. The two major areas of statistics are descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Statistics can be used to make better informed business and investing decisions. So what about biostatistics? As the name implies, biostatistics or biometry it is the branch of biological science concerned with the study and methods for collecting, presenting, analyzing, and interpreting biological research data. Not any data, but biological research data. The primary aim of this branch of science is to allow researchers, healthcare providers, and public health administrators to make decisions concerning a population using sample data. For example, if the government wants to know the prevalence of a specific health problem among dock workers, suppose there are 200,000 dock workers, it is not realistic or accessible to test each of them individually. However, one should determine, uh, in order to determine uh, whether they have increased risk for susceptible disease, for disease, for example. So, a more realistic approach is to select a sample or a subset of the population and then apply the results to the entire group. This discipline makes research possible by providing tools and techniques for collecting, analyzing, and interpreting biological and medical data, allowing stakeholders to draw actionable insights about a population from sample data. So what's the importance of biostatistics in clinical research and public health? One should highlight that uh, biostatistics is not only used at the end of your research experiment, but it should start from the beginning. It is not only used to analyze the results of your clinical trial, but it should be used in order to design in the clinical trial. So in general, biostatisticians are appointed in clinical research study in the initial phase to assist the research team in analyzing objectives, methods of data analysis, and overall study design for better outcome. A vital component of study design instance is the sample size. And this is very, very important. Some, uh, uh, some research papers are just rejected because they do not have adequate sample size or because the sample size is small. So a small sample size can lead to underperformed research with an unsatisfactory outcome. And in contrast, a large sample is a waste of time and resources. Here, I'm pleased to uh, highlight that um, biostatistical services provided by EditAge can help uh, in uh, this issue, for example, and in other biostatistics related issues. Also, after research design comes the next step, which is data monitoring and management. Biostatisticians assist the formulation of data management plans and specify areas of uh, approvable flow in data collection. And unfortunately, this introduces a high level of tangibility in data collection and analysis. 
Then that analysis and reporting by statisticians take collected data as a facet of clinical research study and employ statistical techniques to conclude that data and report unusual data trends. Clinical research reporting includes statistical methods and briefing of the method, data interpretations, and visual representation as a part of the collaborative process between biostatisticians and researchers. Here are some examples of how biostatistics has been used to inform decision-making in healthcare. For example, the uh, Helmholtz Center for Infection Research applied biostatistic techniques to forecast the potential of health systems to be overwhelmed by COVID-19 patients. Also, biostatistics measured the effectiveness of public health interventions in Mozambique to address sanitary conditions and improve patient outcomes. Last and but not least, statistical models identified characteristics associated with short and long-term survival rates for patients diagnosed with colorectal cancer. In addition, there are some examples on how statistics can be used to inform decision-making in academic institutions, as we see that statistics has several applications, both in the field of research or clinical research and on wider scale for academic institutions. As we have highlighted before, while experience and instinct are pivotal, organizations that use data-driven decision-making to gain deeper insights into the needs of students, faculty, and the institution will have a competitive edge. When done properly, a well-planned and implemented data-driven strategy can positively impact all areas of both institutional and student success. Data-driven decision-making gives institutions the opportunity to identify new or missed opportunities respond to new market conditions, launch innovative services, and meet student needs. However, implementing a new database and analytic solution requires more than just flipping a switch and hoping for the best possible outcome. The University of Laverne knew just how important it was to resolve any historical challenges if they wanted a solution that would future-proof their system. They wanted an analytics tool that would give them an informed view into the university operations and transform those insights into student success. To do this, they established a solid data governance policy, addressed the integrity of their data on campus, and crafted a change uh, management process to support implementation. This approach has already seen some excellent results for Laverne, as they are now able to bring valuable insights to the table so that stakeholders can make data-informed decisions that can have real positive impact for the institution. Also, when an institution adopts a data-driven culture, collaboration and communication becomes much easier. Many universities and colleges have their campuses spread out and operate in silos. Uh, each college or each university has some uh, isolated, uh, some uh, isolated departments that have a very big barrier for communication. So it's likely that the history department, for example, doesn't talk to the science department and vice versa, but data can show that they may be facing similar battles. Whether it's obtaining funding for research or keeping students engaged, when you bring disparate campuses and silos together, it makes it easier for sure to identify and solve common challenges and grow together. As a result, they had seen a dramatic uptick in student engagement with an impressive 192% increase in student appointments in Edinburgh University. Monica Klem, Director of the Office of Career Development at Edinburgh University, said, we are finding that our resources are getting significantly more attention than in the past, and this is in the first three months of implementation of statistics. We are excited to see what the first year of statistical analysis of data will look like given these early successes. So, as we have talked about the importance of data, we have to also highlight the suitable techniques for data collection and management, the strategies for collecting and managing data effectively, the importance of ensuring data quality and accuracy, and the best practices for data storage and security. Well, data collection is a systematic process of gathering observations or measurements. Whether you are performing research for business, governmental, or academic purposes, data collection allows you to gain first-hand knowledge and original insights into your research problem. Although methods and aims may differ between fields, the overall process of data collection remains largely the same. 
Before you begin collecting data, you need to consider three main issues, which are the aim of the research, the type of data you will collect, and the methods and procedures you will use to collect, store, and process the data. To collect high quality data that is relevant to your purposes, you can follow these four steps. First of all, as we said, define the aim of your research, choose your data collection method, plan your data collection procedures, and collect the data. Concerning the aim of your research before starting the process of data collection, this aim should be uh, uh, exactly identified. You can start by writing a problem statement, for example, what is the practical or scientific issue that you want to address and why does it matter? Next, you can formulate one or more research questions that precisely define what you want to find out. Depending on your research questions, you might need to collect either quantitative or qualitative data. So quantitative data is expressed mainly in numbers and graphs and is analyzed through statistical methods. Qualitative data is expressed in words and analyzed through interpretations and categorizations. If your aim is to test a hypothesis, measure something precisely, or gain large-scale statistical insights, collect quantitative data. But if your aim is to explore ideas, understand experiences, or gain detailed insights into a specific context, collect qualitative data. If you have several aims, you can use, of course, a mixed methods approach that collects both types of data. Step two, choose your data collection method. Based on the data you want to collect, decide which method is best suited for your research. Experimental research is uh, primarily a quantitative method. Interviews, focus groups, and ethnographies are qualitative methods. Surveys, observations, archival research, and secondary data collection can be quantitative or qualitative methods. Um, this table represents the different collection methods. For example, experiments is mainly used to test a causal relationship. How to collect the data, mainly manipulate variables and measure their effects on others. The second one is surveys. It is used to understand the general characteristics or opinions of a group of people. Data are collected by distributing a list of questions to a sample online, in person, or over the phone. The, the, the method after that is interview or focus group. It is used to gain an in-depth understanding of perceptions or opinions on a topic. Data are collected by verbally asking participants some open-ended questions in individual interviews or focus group discussions. Then observation, it is mainly used to understand something in its natural setting. Data are collected by measuring or surveying a sample without trying to affect them. Then ethnography is mainly used to study the culture of a community or organization firsthand. And data are collected by joining and participating in a community and recording your observations and reflections. Then archival research uh, it is mainly used to understand current or historical events, conditions, or practices. And data are collected by accessing manuscripts, documents, or records from libraries, depositories, or the internet. Secondary data collection used to analyze data from populations that you can't access firsthand. So data here are collected by finding first existing data, set, data sets that have already been collected from sources such as government agencies or research organizations. Step three is to plan your data collection procedures. When you know which methods or methods you are using, you need to plan exactly how you will implement them. What procedures will you follow to make accurate observations or measurements of the variables you are interested in? For instance, if you are conducting surveys or interviews, decide what form the questions will take. If you are conducting an experiment, make decisions about your experimental design, determine, for example, the inclusion and exclusion criteria, and so on. So what about operationalization? Sometimes your variables can be measured either directly, for example, you, yourself can collect the data on the average age of employees simply by asking for their birth dates. However, often you will be interested in collecting data on more abstract concepts or variables that can't be directly observed. Operationalization means turning abstract conceptual ideas into measurable observations. When planning how you will collect data, you need to translate the conceptual definition of what you want to study into the operational definition of what you will actually measure. 
Some examples of operationalization include, for example, you have decided to use surveys to collect quantitative data. The concept you want to measure is the leadership of managers. You operationalize this concept in two ways. You ask managers to rate their own leadership skills on a five-point scale, assessing the ability to delegate decisiveness and de uh, de dependability. You ask then the direct employees to provide anonymous feedback on their managers regarding the same topics. Using multiple ratings of a single concept can help you cross-check your data and assess the test validity of your measures. As we have highlighted before, sampling is indeed a very important for clinical trials. As we have said before, that some research studies are just uh, rejected because they do not have the correct or the required sample size, either too small or too big. So you may need to develop a sampling plan to obtain data systematically. This involves defining a population, the group you want to draw conclusions about, and a sample, which is the group you will actually collect data from. Your sampling method will determine how you recruit participants or obtain measurements for your study. To decide on a sampling method, you will need to consider factors such as the required sample size, the accessibility of the sample, and the time frame of data collection. Then comes a very important step, which is standardizing procedures. If multiple researchers are involved, then you have to write a detailed manual to standardize data collection procedures in your study. This means laying out specific step-by-step -step instructions so that everyone in your research team collects data in a consistent way. For example, by conducting experiments under the same conditions and using objective criteria to record and categorize observations. This helps you avoid common research biases, such as omitted variable bias or information bias. This helps ensure the, the readability of your data, and you can also use it to replicate the study in the future, which means to repeat the study in the future. Then step four, which is collect the data. Finally, you can implement your chosen methods to measure or observe the variables you are interested in. Examples of collecting quantitative and uh, qualitative data include, for example, to collect data about perceptions of managers, you administer a survey with closed and open-ended questions to a sample of 300 company employees across different departments and locations. The closed-ended questions ask participants to rate their managers' leadership skills on scales from 1 to 5, the data produced is numerical and can be statistically analyzed for averages and patterns. The open-ended questions, on the other hand, ask participants for examples of what the manager is doing well now and what they can do better in the future. The data produced is qualitative in this case and can be categorized through content analysis for further insights. So, for sure, the data quality is a very, very important aspect. For data to be beneficial, it needs to be of high quality. The better your data's quality, the more you can get out of it. If your information is low quality, it can even be harmful. If you base a decision on bad quality, you are likely to make the wrong choice. Some of the potential benefits of good data quality include that they provide insight on where to invest time, money and resources, evaluate the use of campus buildings, services and facilities, monitor success of classes and other campus programs, manage and collect student applications, improve advising processes and services, help underserved students, promote diversity on campus. Uh, then, now you have collected your data, which is for sure very, very precious for you. So how to store your data? Data storage can seem pretty simple. You can just store the data, for example, on a hard drive or cloud. However, you should ask yourself some questions about the data before you start making decisions about storage, which are how important is the data? Do I need to keep this data and can it be reproduced or is it unique? How long do I want or need to keep the data? How fast do I need to access the data? How secure do I need to keep the data? Do other people need access? and what institutional or further requirements need to be adhered to. In order to safely store the data, you first need to locate all of your data files that you want to store, then decide what you need to keep, and create a directory identifying your data files by name, format, size, and file location, and keep it current and up to date. 
label the data containers and the media in the containers. What happens if they get separated? Locate and or create supplemental documentation, metadata for each data file. Include variable names, descriptions, used to transform the data. Software also including the version and the operating system. What do you need to be able to use this data file if you do not remember? Organize the files and document your organization methodology and use this consistently. Consistency is very, very important. Concerning file naming, this is very important in, in case you need to retrieve your files. First of all, you need to be consistent and use descriptive names. For example, don't just use numbers one, two, three, but instead you can use a name, for example, clinical uh, trial uh, amoxicillin and so on. And then the, the name should not be too long, a maximum of 32 characters, for example, camel case. As you see, there is no space between the two uh, words, camel and case. Try to include time. Also, you can use the date and add the date. Okay. For example, using year, month, day format and to create a chronological order. Use version numbers in case, for example, the experiment was repeated um, several times or you have any uh, factors that have uh, affected the experiment. So you need to use version numbers. Don't use special characters and don't use um, hyphens or underscores. Don't change default extensions. For example, is a file is in uh, .pdf, .doc, .docx format. Do not change the default extensions because this can corrupt the file and identify the different versions clearly. Concerning file organizations, this is very important. Here, folders should be named for major functions or activities. Then structure by date or event in the subfolders. The names should be self-explanatory. Avoid duplication, then make it simple and consistent. Uh, for example, say you are organizing the data uh, of your experiment. You will say experiment on antibiotics. Then you will have subfolder of antibiotic number one and two and so on. So the folder names should be self-explanatory and avoid duplication. A very important issue also is to never work with your primary data file. Always make a copy to work with. Your computer hard drive or working environment should only store your current working data file. But your primary, master or raw data file should be stored in a safe environment and backed up. Because disasters and accidents do happen. For example, hardware failures, software problems, virus infections, corrupted data files, power failures, hacking, stolen computers, human error, natural disasters or media degradation. So you need to keep the original file as a read-only file and give it a file name that can be used as the first part of all subsequent files related to it. Then, as we said that we have very precious data, we have to make some backup for our data. You can follow the 3 to one rule. Data backups are very important. What is the 3 to one rule? You can keep three copies of any important data files, a primary and two backups. Keep two copies on different digital media, for example, a hard disk and a flash drive. Keep one copy off-site or at least offline. This is sometimes called the here, near and far approach. The working copy is here, the primary backup is near and the second backup is far. Uh, some common sense tips include you have to take care that desktops, tablets, laptops, and phones should not be used for storage of your raw, original, or only copy of data. Also, removable media concerning USBs, flashcards, memory cards, CDs, DVDs, uh, and so on should not be used also for storage of your raw, original, or only copies of data. Why? Because all removable media are subject to degradation and failure. It will happen. Removable media are all inherently vulnerable to temperature and humidity fluctuations, poor handling, air, moisture, light conditions, theft, even mechanical breakdowns or forgetfulness. So manage your stored data. Visit often, at least once a year. Migrate your data media to new media on a preset schedule. Migrate to newer formats when possible. Migrate to newer software if possible. And always verify data consistency. 
keep your directory up to date and keep a current copy with your data storage options. So we, as we have mentioned that computers are not very safe to store your data. So where you can store them? We can recommend, for example, uh, some services provided by Microsoft, such, such as OneDrive and SharePoint. SharePoint is used in case uh, multiple users need to access the data. Uh, also, another storage space is provided by Google, which is Google Drive, and we also have Dropbox. So then we can go to an overview of the different statistical methods used in biostatistics. In biostatistics, for each of the specific situations, statistical methods are valuable are available for analysis and interpretation of the data. To select the appropriate statistical method, one needs to know the assumption and conditions of the statistical methods so that proper statistical method can be selected for data analysis. As we have mentioned before, two main statistical methods are used in data analysis, which are descriptive statistics. This summarizes data, uses indices, such as the mean and the median, and inferential statistics, which draws conclusions from data using statistical tests, such as the student's t-test. To select the appropriate statistical method, you have, again, to determine the aim and objective of the study, the type and distribution of data, whether it is parametric or non-parametric, and the nature of the observations, which means either paired or unpaired. What does it mean, paired or unpaired? Suppose you are trying to compare the effects of two drugs on two different groups of patients. In this case, it is called unpaired because we have two different groups of patients. Each of them is taking a different drug. Here, you can use unpaired analysis. What about paired Paired is used to compare the data of the same patient, for example, before and after administration of a drug. For example, you measure the baseline level of uh, uh, serum uh, glucose level, for example, and then you measure the serum glucose level once more for the same patient, but after administration of a certain drug. In this case, you can better use paired analysis. All types of statistical methods that are used to compare the means are called parametric, whereas statistical methods used to compare other than means, for example, medians or proportions, are called non-parametric methods. To test the efficacy of a new, for example, here is a poll um, to test the efficacy of a new anti-hyperpolesterolemic drug, serum cholesterol levels were assessed before and after drug administration. Suppose the test results were normally distributed Please recommend a statistical test. Uh, this is a poll. So please take a moment to choose either unpaired student's t-test or one-way ANOVA or paired student's t-test. So most of you have suggested paired students value and after students see us the same patient or in the same case before then we need to use paired students.
So back to our presentation, we'll need to talk about hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing starts with the assumption of no difference between groups or no relationship between variables in the population. This is called in statistics, this is called the null hypothesis. It's always paired with an alternative hypothesis, which is your research prediction of an actual difference between groups or the true relationship between variables. Uh, for example, the non alternative hypothesis say you test whether a new drug intervention can alleviate the symptoms of an autoimmune disease. In this case, the null hypothesis is that the new drug has no effect on the symptoms of the disease. The alternative hypothesis is that the drug is effective for alleviating the symptoms of the disease. Then, you decide whether the null hypothesis can be rejected based on your data and the results of a statistical test. Since these decisions are based on probabilities, there is always a risk of making the wrong conclusion. If your results show statistical significance, that means they are very unlikely to occur if the null hypothesis is true. In this case, you would reject your null hypothesis. But sometimes this may actually be a type 1 error, which is a false positive error. A false positive error occurs when you reject the null hypothesis when it is actually true. If your findings, on the other hand, do not show statistical significance, and they have a high chance of occurring if the null hypothesis is true, therefore, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. But sometimes this may be a type 2 error, which is a false negative. This means that you accepted the null hypothesis when actually it was wrong. Uh, okay, so now we'll have a glance on some parametric and their alternative non-parametric methods used for statistical analysis. For example, we have the description here, descriptive statistics. It is in case parametric methods, then you will have the mean and standard deviation. In case non-parametric, you will have the median and interquartile range. Sample with them a population or hypothetical value. In case it is one sample t-test, n uh, is used when n is lower than 30, and one sample z-test when n is higher than 30. Uh, Non-parametric methods include one sample Wilcox zone signed rank test. Uh, other examples include, for example, predict one outcome variable by at least one independent variable. Parametric methods include linear regression model, and non-parametric methods include non-linear regression models. Concerning proportions, for example, say you test the association between two categorical variables for independent groups. The statistical methods for parametric include chi-square or Fisher exact. Uh, here, the data type variable has two categories. To test the change in proportions between two to three groups, pair the groups, we'll use McNamara or Cochrane Q-test. Comparisons between proportions include also the Z-test for proportions. The selection of the appropriate statistical method is very, very important for the quality of research. It is very important that a researcher knows the basic concepts of statistical methods used to conduct research study that produce valid and reliable results. Of course, we as biological researchers do not have enough knowledge or enough experience with all statistical methods, and that's why we need to consult some uh, a biostatistician, and fortunately also Editage offers some uh, statistics consulting services that all of us need in order to uh, validate our results and also in order to continue with our research studies because unfortunately we are not the experts, so we need to consult some experts. There are various statistical methods that can be used in different situations. Each test makes particular assumptions about the data the assumptions should be taken into consideration when deciding which the most important uh, appropriate test is. Wrong or inappropriate use of statistical methods may lead to defective conclusions and finally would harm the evidence-based practices. Hence, an adequate knowledge of statistics and the appropriate use of statistical tests are important for improving and producing quality biomedical research. However, it is extremely difficult, as we have highlighted before, for biomedical researchers or academicians to learn the entire statistical methods. Therefore, at least basic knowledge is very important so that appropriate selection of statistical methods can be can decide, as well as correct incorrect practices can be recognized in the published research. 
In addition, as we have said before, we need to consult some biostatistician in order to get the best out of our data. There are many softwares available online and offline for analyzing data, although it is a fact that which set of statistical tests are appropriate for the given data and study objective is still very difficult for researchers to understand. Therefore, since planning of the study to data collection, analysis, and final in the review process, proper consultation from statistical experts, for example, from EditAge, may be an alternative option and can reduce the burden from the clinicians to go in depth for statistics, which requires a lot of time and effort and ultimately affect the clinical work. These practices not only ensure the correct and appropriate use of the biostatistical methods in the research, but also ensure the highest quality of statistical reporting in research and journals. So let's take this poll. It states that Mr. FY was tested for COVID-19 based on mild symptoms. The results showed that he does not have coronavirus, but actually he got the infection. Please suggest this can be considered a type 1 error or a type 2 error. Waiting for your decision. Please take a moment to participate in the poll. For nineteen, based on my sense. Mr. FY was tested for COVID-19, does not have coronavirus, but he actually got the infection. This error can be type 1 error or type 2 error. Oh, I see there's... Uh, okay, let, let me... What is the truth here? So, as we have said before, it is a very important aspect of our research is to present our data in a way that is easy to understand. Several plots or several types of plots are available. For example, dot plots it is the simplest way of graphical representation of statistical data. This uh, usually compares the frequency within given categories or different categories. Then the most frequently used graph is bar chart. And the bar graph shows comparison among the given categories the lengths of the bars should be proportional to the numerical values represented by them. In the bar graph, the bars may be plotted either horizontally or vertically, but a vertical bar graph, also known as column bar, is used more than a horizontal one. For example, here, this bar graph represents the heart rate during different activities. Most of the time, the horizontal axis of the graph represents specific categories, and the vertical axis shows discrete numerical values. Then grouped bar chart, it is a way of showing information about different subgroups of the main categories. It allows easy comparisons among groups. For example, here, this grouped bar chart shows the number of procedures per 10,000 population, uh, and... Uh, taking into consideration the age, for example, from 18 to 44, from 45 to 64, and so on, and also compares males and females. Then a histogram, it is quite similar to the bar graph. Both are made up of rectangular bars. The difference is that there is no gap between any two bars in the histogram. It is used to present numerical data. As we see here, the different categories 
are not just um, items, for example, uh, um, heart rate or so on. لا, the هنا, the uh, categories represent numbers or ranges. The line graph, it is the kind of graph which represents data in a way that a series of points are to be connected by segments of straight lines. It is used either to trace a change or also for those response curves. Then we have circle graph or pie chart. A pie chart is defined as a graph which contains a circle. It is divided into sectors. These sectors illustrate the numerical proportion of that. For example, this pie chart represents the proportion of global deaths from various cardiovascular diseases in 2002. Just a glance at the graph, we will see that the most common cause was coronary heart disease, then followed by stroke and then other cardiovascular diseases. So let's take this poll and please have a moment to answer the poll. Suppose a company wants to determine the proportion of employees in each category. Recommend, please recommend a suitable graphical representation, which is dot plot, bar chart, histogram, line graph, and pie chart. Waiting for your participation. Well, let's the uh, let's that any provides the I the clearest and so for it is usually called proportions. When proportions are represented, we mostly prefer the pie chart. Okay. Again, we have to stress that any graphical representation can be selected, but in order to determine proportions, so mainly pie charts represent the clearest representation of proportions. So let's take our take-home message. It is biostatisticians are often responsible for research data operations. And as we have said before, since we are not qualified, we do not have all the knowledge on biostatistics because our main speciality is related to biology or clinical medicine. So we need to consult biostatisticians, for example, those provided by EditAge or other services. The roles may include defining data elements and designing research databases, establishing criteria for and enforcing data quality control procedures, ensuring that monitoring components are integrated into database operations, and optimizing efficient data workflows. Some, uh, um, some departments or some companies may have centralized biostatistics units. They are well positioned to capitalize on faculty members' past experience and knowledge of infrastructure when setting up data operations for new projects. Even if data management activities are housed within other units, biostatisticians may have oversight to ensure that a study's data management plan will result in high quality, complete data that unambiguously address the, the study aims. In addition, biostatisticians can have a lasting impact on clinical and translational research infrastructure by ensuring that data collected to address the primary hypotheses of one study can be used to conduct the secondary analyses for other investigations. 
For example, data collected through clinical trials consortium can be used for hypothesis generating historical cohort analyses. Biostatisticians in larger centralized units will be better able to future proof research infrastructure by using uniform database architectures and design principles that facilitate the reuse of data for unintended but related purposes. Biostatisticians can guide evidence based decision making, thus, provide academic institutions with various opportunities and overcome significant challenges. Thank you all for listening and now waiting for your questions. Well, we have one question here, which is how strong is the originality in doing archival research? Well, let's decide that archival research may be not the best option, maybe not the best option in case you can do your own research, you know, in case you can do your own study you, in your own sample that we have its data hand by hand, please do. In case this is not accessible, in case you have no other choice, so you have yeah, you need to, or then you will have to refer to archival research. It has its own originality when it is uh, probably the most um, interpretation, the highest interpretation is provided. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, does anybody have any questions? Who starts to collect high quality data that is relevant to your purposes? Okay. Okay, here is it. The four steps used to collect high quality data that is relevant to your purposes. The four steps are define the aim of your research, choose your data collection method, plan your data collection procedures, and finally collect the data. Why effect size matter in cross-sectional studies? Well, the effect size represents some um, cornerstone in cross-sectional studies. In case the effect size is small, then this means that uh, the, si the study is not very well uh, planned. And also in case the size is uh, big, again, means that it is not well planned. The effect size, in case you, are certain, you um, assume that there is a big effect, then the smaller sample size can show this effect. But in case the effect size you are searching for is maybe some minimal size, some minimal effect is expected, then in this case, a larger sample size will be required. In which case should pie chart not be used to represent data? Well, pie chart is mainly used for proportions. Pie chart is mainly used for proportions. For example, you say that 40% uh, of uh, the employees uh, work, for example, in the pharmacology department. 20% work in the 
pharmaceutics department. So pie chart is mainly used for proportions. In all other cases, we can uh, use other pie charts or oh, sorry, other charts, other chart types according to individual cases. In case we, for example, uh, are looking for the effects of different categories, the effects of different treatments on certain parameter, then we will use uh, a, a bar chart. In case, for example, we are making some dose response study or we are tracing the change in case we are, for example, you are uh, making a calibration curve, then you will use uh, a line chart. What is the best, uh, sorry, what's the best way to analyze qualitative data from different FGD groups? Sorry, what do you mean by FGD? Could you please provide more interpretation? What is FGD? What's the best way to analyze qualitative data from different FGD groups? What's FD, FGD, please? Well. Okay. We have another question till I get to the suitable info here. What survey methods will be appropriate for quantitative analysis? Well, a survey can be quantitative or qualitative. It can be qualitative in case you are just asking for attributes. For example, you are satisfied or not. This is qualitative. But quantitative is used, for example, say you are measuring the consumer satisfaction, for example, then you have a scale, for example, from one to five, um, where one represents not satisfied at all, two mildly satisfied, three, four, and so on, and five represents highly satisfied. In this case, the output of the survey will be quantitative. Okay. So back to the question is, what's the best way to analyze qualitative data from different focus group discussions? Okay. Let me get back here to the table, just a moment. Well, concerning categories, they are mainly compared using, for example, chi-square test or Fisher exact test. This is used to test the association between two categorical variables. And in order to test proportions for paired groups, then you can use McNamara test or Cochrane Q test. Uh, what's the best way to analyze qualitative data? Oh, it's okay. So I guess this one was already answered. Then uh, I would like to thank you all for attending. I hope you have got some um, benefit from this session. And of course, I hope to see you all in future sessions. Have a good day, all of you. Thank you.